Hello, and welcome again to The Goddess in Art. Our program is dedicated to the creativity of the goddess and to the oldest and most enduring tradition in art, the goddess in art. Worship of the goddess was the earliest, the first religion practiced by human beings. How did this religion view death, the afterlife, the fate of the soul? How does the art created by the people of this goddess culture reflect their beliefs, their myths about death? Our program tonight is an exploration of these questions. My name is Star Goody, and I'm honored this evening to have as my guest Dr. Maria Gimbutas. She is a professor of archaeology at UCLA. She's written numerous books, including The Goddesses and Gods of Old Europe, and her new book, The World of the Goddess, will be coming out this fall. Welcome, Maria. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Maria, as an archaeologist, the study of the goddess cultures has really been your life work. Why don't you set the historical stage for us a little bit? How long was the goddess the central figure of this religion of our ancestors, and what were some of her main attributes? Well, <laughs> it, is, it is really even, I would say, a funny question, because there is no other religion. There is the goddess religion as far as we go back. Of course, we can go back only when, when the art monuments begin, for instance, the cave art and sculptures and all that, but also in even earlier times in Mysterian and Lower Paleolithic, there are uh, finds which indicate that the goddess was already there. There is no father image at all, no male images in sculptures, just the goddesses. So all that shows that there was only one earliest religion, the goddess religion. So we're not just talking 30,000 years, we're talking 50, 100,000? Yes, I mean, of course. If we go very, very deep back in, in time, of course, we cannot speak in detail, but we can speak much more about the goddess from about 30,000 years ago and then even much more from the beginning of the agriculture. Then we have temples, we have images, we have symbols, we have pottery decorated with symbols, and uh, all other finds, uh, and even in tombs, we have signs and engraved, so the symbols tell us a lot. And we can reconstruct the religion. As as the goddess, the great goddess, the central figure, she had what we could call a divine ambivalence, right? She was life, but she was death. And I mean, tonight we're going to be looking at that death. So there was no heaven or hell or God over here or devil here, but she was the, mysteri the mystery that incorporated yeah. it all. There was no division between life-giving and death-wielding. The goddess was in nature, nature itself. And uh, even in the images of death, we feel that this is, this is what we find in nature. And uh, we cannot say that m the question of mortality was uh, not asked. There was a deep, profound interest in mortality. And it was understood as periodicity, reflecting the periodicity of nature, of years, seasons, of also moon cycles of the body of the females who also are periodically changing. So that probably led to the understanding of death as just a short period and then it had to be followed by regeneration. And death does not exist as death. Death is combined always with regeneration. So would you say that her main function, her main duty was regeneration? Well, the goddess was life-giving mm -hmm. and she was also death-wielding. But if we would like to choose what was the most important aspect of her, I would say, yes, the regeneration was an extremely important aspect. So she really had the powers of eternal renewal from her 
it was this exa inexhaustible source of life energy that just kept she coming was, forth. She was, she was the overseer of life energy and she was taking care that life is regenerated immediately after death. If, if the human body is reduced to, to a bone, then the, the, from the bone life comes again and, and uh, also the soul is perceived as continuous. It, it is the same life energy which continues as a bird, as a tree, as an animal, as a flower, as a snake. So the life energy just goes out undifferentiated into the vast energy of yeah, the world. We do not have differentiation at all. The life energy is the same in human beings, in animals, in plants. One thing that we can really tell by that reflects a lot of their beliefs is obviously how they buried their dead. Now the first bit of art and architecture that we're going to be looking at is how they buried their dead. So let's see this. It's a lot of information in tombs. Tomb is womb. And we have, for instance, here a burial in an egg-shaped vase. Egg is itself a symbol of regeneration. Here we see a little child, actually a newborn child, placed in an egg-shaped vase. We see the beginning here. Uh, well, his skeleton can be seen from the opening from front of this vessel. And the egg is actually in a fetal position. I mean, the, not the egg, but the, the bones are laid the in. The bones are in a fetal position. To be reborn again. Yes, and not only children, but also adults were, were buried in egg-shaped vases. But most what we have are egg-shaped tombs. Egg-shaped or oven-shaped or womb-shaped, utero-shaped. Here is an amazing monument from Malta, south of Italy, from the fourth millennium BC, where we have, uh, well, here is just the end of a chamber which is egg-shaped. And in this place, there were three stories of egg-shaped chambers with about 7,000 uh, individuals buried in the course of maybe 1,000 years. So we really have great scale of architecture here. Oh, this is a, a, an amazing architecture, and it's of, of a soft stone called Glo Globogerina, and uh, in Malta the, all the temples are built of the same stone. And there, there were many egg-shaped chambers. Some of them were large, some of them were smaller. And also some ceilings were decorated with red spirals or snakes. So all the symbols are life-giving. Here is a model of a tomb called a passage grave tomb from Wales near Cardiff in England. And this is one of the typical examples of passage grave tombs which are spread along the Atlantic coast from Spain to Sweden. And here we have large stone corridor leading to the end, which is a chamber. This is not a mortuary house. I would say this is a vagina and uterus. The goddess's, goddess's regenerative organs covered with an earthen tumulus, which maybe is symbolic of her belly, of her pregnant belly. So again, being buried, I mean, as life comes from the uterus in the womb, you return to that uterus in that womb. We, the dead return to the uterus, and then they are regenerated in the uterus. Several examples from Ireland, for instance, these are the so-called court tombs. One of the court tombs in Western Ireland they are called court tombs, so they have nothing to do with courts or palaces, <laughs> but this is again, I would say, the uterus of the goddess, regenerative uterus, and the dead were buried after, after the body decomposed, the bones were collected and buried in such tombs. Now something like this, this structure is 5,000 years old. Well, right? this is fourth millennium or even the beginning of the third millennium. This is another example of the Krevi Kiel in Ireland, which is clearly a womb of the goddess, has nothing to do with a house-like structure. 
and uh, in in all the architecture of megalithic Europe, we have the same idea. It is pervasive throughout. It has a very different concept in burial than, for instance, the Indo-Europeans have. They built mortuary mortuary tombs only, and uh, they believe that the life has to continue in a linear fashion and the same life will continue in the afterlife whereas the old Europeans before the Indo-Europeans believed in the continuity of the same life energy. Now it, it, the Indo-Europeans of course are the patriarchal b yeah, worship the, the patriarchal people, the warriors and they, they really worshipped the individual, they worshipped the heroes and especially the kings and buried them very lavishly with even with wives and servants. So there was and other people sacrificed and, and chariots yeah. and all. In old Europe, we do not find anything of this kind. Now, in old Europe, we find in the tombs and in the shrines, we often see owls or vultures. We see really birds of prey and, and they're associated yes, with here, death. Yes, of course. The first symbol that we can notice in tombs is the bird of prey. The owl goddess is dominating in Western Europe and also in, in parts of Central Europe and then in Turkey and the Mediterranean area there is a real vulture goddess. All right, let's take a look at the next pieces of architecture in the tombs and the shrines because we see these goddesses. And this is a, an exquisite piece of art. Well, this is from a very famous tomb of Naut in Ireland, about the middle of the fourth millennium. The owl is here represented because we can see her round eyes, but the body is all engulfed in a labyrinthine design, and the vulva is in the middle. So we see that this bird, who is probably the, <coughs> the goddess herself, is concerned with regeneration. And some of the owls are represented only by her eyes, or her beak and eyes, or her breasts, or her vulva, or even just her necklace. Yeah. In many of the megalithic tombs in Brittany, then the just breasts are found, or just necklaces and breasts together. Mm -hmm. And in the famous New Grange in Ireland, there are all eyes of the goddess on the ceiling. Well, th this example would show you very well that the owl is not only the death goddess, she is promoter of death, for border of death, and, and beliefs and folklore we still have her role as as a harbinger of death. But these two urns are from Troy, uh, around 3000 BC, are decorated with a snake or umbilical cord and a vulva. So of course she is at once death and regeneration. And she also has a sense of one's fate. The owl represents the good fate, the bad fate, that and one is going is to die. Correct. This is the other side of the fate. Now we have more of these owls. This is one, uh, one grave from northeastern Hungary where the whole family is buried in owl-shaped urns. Uh, you see the mother and three children. And uh, in other cases we have just urns and owl eyes or, or some schematic image of an owl. So she really is carrying the death there, isn't she? <laughs> you, you cannot sense that this is really a death representation. Now I shall say something about the Çatalhöyük temples in Turkey uh, from the 7th millennium BC. There are some shrines have frescoes of vultures. Here we see seven vultures and they are attacking human beings. And the, hum the humans are already headless, so the skull probably was removed and placed under the this, this skull or a sculpture of a bull. And these vultures certainly are not imitations of real vultures. They are half, half goddess and vulture with, with human legs and, th and the wings are rectangular, not, not so much as we 
uh, not so much yes. uh, oval or s or rounded because the, this is the goddess's birth. Are we also sort of getting the sense of giving this this vulture, this death goddess, her due, her that the life she's going to be feeding on the life of the human being? So it's sort of giving her well, her. From that we judge that the excarnation rites existed, uh -huh. and first the dead were placed. Uh, for uh, for the birds, and after the flesh was removed, then the bones were collected and placed in graves. So the, these shrines are really indicative of excarnation rites, which are also known from Western Europe, even continuous into the Bronze Age in Scotland, where they were in megalithic tombs discovered many birds, uh, many bir bones of birds of prey. That's really interesting. Now, th this idea of bone kind of brings us to what I think is one of the most mysterious and sort of intriguing aspects of the goddess is her death aspect as the white lady of death or the stiff nude or she who takes death into her body. Yes, well, she is as stiff as a bone, and the figurines that we found find in, in, in Neolithic and later, they are so stiff and are produced of bone, of marble, of alabaster, even of amber, mm -hmm. because the white color or yellow color was the color of death. Also, there is a sense that she's also called the chrysalis goddess. The chrysalis are the cocoon in the sense that she's very still and she's very stiff. Yes. But inside, there is a magical transformation taking there place. There is, and she's shown with a huge triangle, and this triangle is the womb, the generative triangle, and from that triangle, the life should begin. So even though we're, she's taking the de our deaths inside her body, and there's that hint of the triangle so that she will regenerate, even though she is very much a death aspect. But let's take a look at that. Now this is, for me, some of the most beautiful art created around this figure of the white goddess. Yes, there are some of them are very beautiful, but, uh, but also, well, I, I would like to indicate that some of these images are formidable, and yes. <laughs> they have enormous masks, a very long mouth and teeth, which are her fangs, and then, uh, yes, she has a triangle, and triangle is a regenerative symbol. So uh, this this is the beginning of, of the masks, which later on developed into the Gorgon masks. Uh -huh. But some of these figures do not have such, um, Frightening masks. Uh, some have just just a nose, no mouth, and therefore I think that these images either are birth of prey goddesses or they are poisonous snakes. From folklore, we know that the death image, the white lady, she appears as a human being, but she appears also as a bird or as a poisonous snake. I see. Now, now these are the, go yes, ahead. <laughs> this is a typical uh, illustration of the well-known Cycladic figurines of marble, which usually are not interpreted as death images, but they must be death images because this is a tradition of millennia. We begin in the Paleolithic and then they continue even later into the Bronze Age in the Mediterranean area. In Cyprus even, she appears as a lilith, as a real, really beautiful bird of prey with, uh, with earrings, with, with a beak and with a huge triangle. And here she was that still goddess where the life is, you get the sense of the stillness on the outside, but well, a transformation this, this is inwardly. She, this is she, really a very good example of this type which begins in the Paleolithic and continues for at least 30,000 years. Now this is Lilith, the owl goddess. So already we see from the stiff goddess, yet here's life coming forth. Here we see her holding a little baby, right? Well, yes, this is a sort of a Madonna. Ah. We, have, we have the new life appearing right here. All right. Um, so, fr again, from this aspect of death, and she t transforms, and so we see new life, and 
uh, and in the goddess, there are many animals uh, that are associated with this new life. We have the hedgehog, we have the bee, we also have the butterfly, which really fits in with that cocoon yes. motif of life. We shall begin to speak of her now, and, and this is sort of a cosmic goddess who is taking care of all life, and she is balancing the life powers, and she sees that life doesn't go over the border. <laughs> She is killing, she is destroying, but she is also bringing the life from, from the body of her own, but also she appears as a frog, a fish, a triangle, or a double triangle, a hedgehog, and, and a bull's head. Bull's head is also a symbol of uterus, and as a butterfly. And all these images of the goddess are really associated with the, uni with the uterus, right, or the womb, and, and with the moon, too, that sense and of periodicity. And and this is all one goddess. Oh. The charming thing is that she can change her shape from one to another, and, and she can be a bee and a butterfly, and she can be at the same time uh, a fish, or a hedgehog, or a frog. All right, let's take a look at the goddess in these images. Now, uh, this is uh, this is the Lepinski Veer. Lepinski Veer is a Neolithic sacred place on the Danube in northern Yugoslavia, where there were triangular shrines discovered, mm -hmm. and these triangular shrines had red plaster, uh, lime plastered stone floors. And at the end of these shrines stood sculptures, and they are mostly fish-woman hybrids. And the fish, we know from later periods, is a uterus. Fish is a moist creature, and ah. the uterus is moist, mm. so this is the connection. And in, in art, there are many, many fish which are decorated with with uh, net design. Now here is a Lepinski Veer sculpture of a fish, but she also has human features. And there are about 54 sculptures discovered in the settlement. And this and is only in this area, it's sort of a cult of this area? Just this area, but oh. the fish is always uh, portrayed in, in, in the pictorial art, so it's not only Lepinski Veer where we find fish. But it is an amazing place because 54 uh, large sculptures of stone have been discovered there. And she was the main, main goddesses. But now, here is a frog. Very the animated frog here. <laughs> a beautiful frog. The frog is another rather predominant image. There are many frogs discovered of stone and of clay. This one is of clay, but they are also images of green stone, of black stone. Also, uh, there are figurines which have human uh, head. And the frog from folklore and also from classical times and Egyptian beliefs is known to be uh, the goddess. She, yes. is, she is in the womb, and people until now believe in a wandering womb. So she is the one who starts the life. The hedgehog is another figure. Uh, this one had a, a lid with the goddess's face, and the beginning of the symbol of the hedgehog probably goes down to the Paleolithic times uh, from the observation of animal uteri, which are with words. And again, all these images are really the same goddess, but they're just in this different is images. The, same. the, the belief in, in hedgehogs still continues. And now here is a, a vase, and on one side we see a triangle. This is the goddess's triangle, or a V, which is an insignia of this goddess. On another side is uh, an engraving of the goddess made of two triangles. So we speak of a goddess in the hourglass shape. 
And the triangle is one of the earliest images of the goddess, the right? The triangle is one, probably the earliest symbol we have in the Mysterian times, graves which were covered with triangular stones. How long ago would that be? Oh, it goes back to 100,000 <gasps> years. And then in the Neolithic and Copper Age of Europe, this is one of the very frequent figures that is found. This one is from Hungary, fifth, fifth millennium. This is from Romania, another image on the vase, which has clearly a bird of prey feet instead of hands. The other one also had the hands of the bird goddess. So she is the one who is regenerating life powers. Now here we have an image of the bucranium, or the bull skull, the sacrifice bull, out of which life arises, right? Yes, <laughs> and, and the bucranium is one of the goddesses' symbols, of, uh, which is also uterus. I mean, it just looks like a uterus with the fallopian yes, tubes. And, yes, fallopian tu yeah. tubes are like horns, yeah. and the heads which are produced are really flat heads, not like bull heads, not like cow heads. They are imitations of female uteri. And we see the goddess, the triangular the goddess, goddess here carved right there. As an hourglass shape appears from the uterus. This is the, the beginning of the symbolism which continues in the Menon culture and it's well known as sacred horns and from which the butterfly appears. Here is a good example. This is even from the 14th century BC, mm. a painting on a sarcophagus. Uh, the, the horns are stylized and the butterfly is also stylized, but this is the same idea as it was 5,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago and probably began in the Paleolithic. Here so is this is a tomb, but we see life, the, well, the imagery is life rising from the uterus. Life rising from the uterus, and this is the predominant symbol on all the sarcophagi and also on other uh, a vase painting, for instance, in Minoan Creed. Here is the butterfly with almost human head, and then she has hands which are not human. Definitely, these are birds' feet. And so she is a manifestation of the same goddess who appeared as a hedgehog, fish frog, bucranium, and butterfly. Now, in, from languages, we can also reconstruct uh, who she is. For instance, in, in Breton or Irish, she is Maro. In Slavic, she is Mara, Morava. But these names also mean butterfly and the goddess. And these names are also connected with the meaning of nightmare. Actually, English nightmare is the uh -huh. same German mar and, and French cauchemar belongs to the same group. So now we this only is a whole a series of interconnections. So it, just in this last minute that we have left, really what we can see is an imagery where life comes from the womb, goes back to the womb and regenerates from there and we see like the soul rising from those horns as the butterfly and returning to the great resources in the vast goddess really. Yes, uh, this is a beautiful philosophy of earth reverencing, earth loving and we didn't have to, to see there the images of black gods and of chilly and gloomy underworld. Well, thank you so much, Maria, for being my guest and for sharing your knowledge with us and my viewers. Thank you very much. Okay.